Good afternoon. I'm Stephen Monsbach, and I'm currently the president of AMIAS, which is the Association of Members of the Institute for Advanced Study. And on behalf of all the members of the Institute for Advanced Study, former, current, and future, if I can be so bold, I welcome, to, welcome you to this lecture. Today's lecture will be given by Nadia Zemkowska. Dr. Zemkowska took her degree at Princeton, not terribly far from here, although some of us think it's maybe farther than geography. In any event, she has been not just at Princeton, but she's been almost five years at the Institute. First as a postdoctoral member from September 2005 through August 2008, and from January 2008 to 2010, she was a long-term member. From the Institute, she went to the Johns Hopkins University, where she's currently assistant professor of physics and astronomy. Her work deals with the planets, with the galaxies, and our travel there. And she's going to take us on a, an adventure today. In fact, she's going to allow us to be gone with the wind, black holes and their gusty influence, uh, the birth of galaxies. So I invite Nadia to take us on that journey into the universe. Yeah. Um, thank you all so very much for coming. I hope this is going to be fun. Um, I will be talking about one of the major issues in modern extragalactic astronomy, um, namely the issue of galaxy formation. Um, and specifically, I will focus about on the issue of um, galactic winds. Um, and I would like to start by emphasizing that this is a very observations-driven field. Um, this is not some hypothetical phenomenon. Um, this is something that we can actually observe and detect and measure um, using existing facilities, telescope facilities on the ground and in space. And so um, here on the first slide, I already am showing you a picture of a galaxy wind. Um, this is a galaxy, um, M82, as seen in the visible light using a normal optical telescope. Um, it's a disk galaxy, so I have this spectacular prop here. Okay, it's a disk galaxy that we're seeing edge on, which is why it's appearing elongated on the sky. And nothing much is happening in the visible range, but if you look in the um, infrared light, in this case using the NASA Spitzer Space Telescope, then you see these dramatic red plumes emanating from the center of the galaxy. Um, it turns out that the stuff is emitting in the infrared because it's made up of tiny little dust particles that is the material very similar to the car exhaust. So this galaxy is doing a lot of spring cleaning and getting rid of um, some yucky stuff um, by, um, by doing something really explosive in its center. In this particular case, we don't actually think that the black hole is involved, and this is probably due to the explosions of um, uh, massive stars. But I will have some um, other examples later in the talk. All right, so we will start um, with an overview of how galaxies form from shortly after the Big, ba big Bang um, to um, um, modern day. Uh, I will discuss differences between normal matter and dark matter. Then I have a list of outstanding issues that we do not understand. Um, then I will shift gears and I will talk about supermassive black holes. How do we know that they exist? Um, also, you may have heard that once things fall into the black hole, nothing can get out. So a legitimate question to ask is, well, what can they do if nothing can get out? So we will discuss that. And then I will talk about the surprising role that the supermassive black holes play in the evolution of their host galaxy. So I will talk about how the galaxy feeds its black hole and how the black hole stars its host galaxy. Galaxies are composed of billions to trillions of stars. Um, and roughly speaking, in the modern day universe, they come in two types. Um, some galaxies are spherical, so here's another valuable prop, um, made up mostly of old stars, um, which happen to appear yellow and red in astronomical images. So here's an example of an old elliptical galaxy. And then other galaxies are disk galaxies, so we've already seen one disk galaxy. Here's another disk galaxy that appears face on this time. 
And um, there's actually a companion galaxy over here. But in the center of this disk galaxy, again, you see some stars that are yellow and red. So those are old. Um, but the appearance of this galaxy is really dominated by those blue um, specks of light. Those happen to be stars that are very young that are being formed out of the gas that is also present in this galaxy. So gas and stars. Um, in elliptical and disk galaxies are made of normal matter, the kind of matter that you would encounter in the table of chemical elements. And most of the normal matter in the universe is composed of hydrogen and helium. Um, and the stars in, and gas in the galaxy are held together by the gravity. And just like the planets move around the sun in the gravity of the sun, the stars move around the center of the galaxy in the gravity of the galaxy. And we can measure those motions. And uh, when we do this, we find that the matter that we see in these images is vastly inadequate to explain the gravity that must be holding those objects together. So hence the word dark matter. There is something dark that we cannot see in these images that dominates the gravity of these objects uh, at a tune of about 85%. Um, there's a great variety of galaxies. Um, some elliptical galaxies are pretty round. Some are much more squashed. Some disk galaxies are pretty well organized. Um, some are much more chaotic. But in all of those cases, whenever we make the measurements, we find that there's uh, much too much gravity, um, uh, much more than can be explained by just the stuff that we see. Um, so, um, the gravity must be dominated by this mysterious dark matter. So we now grew to understand that the universe um, consists of this network of dark matter, and the galaxies live on only in very specific places in this network. Um, and specifically, galaxies like the highest um, concentration points of dark matter. Um, this is one of the deepest images of the sky ever taken by humankind using the Hubble Space Telescope. And the astronomers who took this image can also measure the distances to those galaxies. And so they can construct a three-dimensional map and make this movie of a flyby through this three-dimensional space. Um, so we can see that the universe is largely empty and dark uh, with those luminous specks um, here and there. And so we're traveling. Um, out to larger and larger distances until we're actually going to get to the edge of the visible universe and run out of galaxies um, right around there. Um, so um, now, nowadays, the universe, as you can see, is very highly inhomogeneous in that um, there are these very dense regions in space that are populated by luminous galaxies. But you may have heard that after the Big Bang, um, the universe started very smooth. And we know this from the observations of cosmic microwave background, and if you, uh, which is an echo of the Big Bang that was produced only 400,000 years after the Big Bang. If you were to look at the cosmic microwave emission, you would see something like this. This is, of course, not the picture that they would put in the press release, because it's rather boring. Um, so what they do is they subtract off the very smooth um, emission, and they reveal these small fluctuations. And the fluctuations are very small indeed, to the tune of a few parts per million. So what happens is that shortly after the Big Bang, the universe is very smooth with just a little bit of density fluctuation. So some parts of the universe are slightly more dense, whereas others are slightly under dense. And then a lot of time elapses between then and now, and gravity is doing work on those fluctuations all the time. And so the gravity wants to collapse the over-densities and empty out the under-densities. Um, all of these considerations are put together in uh, what is now a basic galaxy formation theory. We start with a universe that is fairly smooth. We can actually ignore the normal matter and consider the universe that is completely dominated by dark matter. What we see dominates the gravity in the local universe. It wants to smooth the fluctuations over, but the gravity wants to bring um, the fluctuations closer together. It turns out that the gravity wins, and so small structures assemble into bigger and bigger structures. This is one of the um, most ambitious 
astronomical computations uh, performed by many supercomputers over many weeks of time. You start off with a universe that's very homogeneous. The pink regions are slightly overdense, and the darker regions are slightly underdense. And the matter is constantly falling from the underdense regions onto the overdense regions under the influence of gravity. Um, and so you can see that the clumps become more and more concentrated until the simulation stops at the present time. And so at the present time, you see this very characteristic picture in which the dark matter is assembled into these narrow filaments and bright knots, and in between there is nothing. There are voids and cells that are pretty much empty of matter. Um, here is another view of the exact same calculation. This time, we're going to fix the time at the present time, and we're going to zoom in to see the structures on different scales. Um, so, again, we are seeing that on large scales, the universe is fairly smooth, but if we zoom in all the way, um, we see that the dark matter is concentrated into those filaments, and the voids are very empty indeed. Um, we're zooming in onto a very massive structure, and only now you are seeing all those little bright individual specks are the locations where the luminous galaxies can actually form. So all those thousands of little specks are the places where the normal galaxies will eventually live. All right, so we've talked about the dark matter. Uh, what is happening to the normal matter? So hydrogen and helium, the stuff that, that um, and, and all the other uh, chemical elements. So normal matter is affected by the gravity, uh, largely produced by the dark matter. And what happens is that normal matter flows into those filaments, and along the filaments in this dark matter-dominated web, um, into the knots of the web. And it can cool and become denser and start forming stars. And this is what we see in this calculation. So this time we're seeing um, again, the same familiar filamentary structure, but now we're looking at the gas instead of the dark matter. And the gas right now is tracking the dark matter, and it's flowing into the knots to produce, um, to produce those first galaxies. And so the galaxies continue um, eating up stuff that's arriving from the dark matter web, um, so this galaxy just swallowed a clump of gas, and it continues to grow in mass and increase in size. And then sometimes several big galaxies are brought together. So we're going to see a couple um, of bigger galaxies that are coming together, and they're going to do this complicated song and dance due to the gravity, due to their mutual gravity. Um, so they're going to exchange some material, and sometimes bigger this, these galaxies will merge into one much bigger object. Um, so as the time goes on, galaxies um, get bigger and bigger by swallowing small clumps of gas and uh, merging with bigger galaxies. All right. So this basic galaxy formation theory um, has produced a lot of successes. Um, in particular, we now, for the first time in the history of humanity, understand the geometry of the universe very well. You may have heard the expression precision cosmology. Um, this is a phrase coined to reflect the fact that we now understand the geometry of the universe to better than a few percent. Um, and this is a development that happened over the last um, 10, 15 years. In particular, one thing that we can understand very well is things like propagation of light through space. Even from the objects well, you know, well very far away over at the edge of the observable universe. Another thing that we understand is that galaxies are the luminous knots in the filamentary structure, largely created by the dark matter. This is again illustrated in this, um, in this other simulation produced by the Stanford group. The blue stuff is the dark matter, um, again assembled into those filaments, and then now they're going to show you where the galaxies are located. So the galaxies sit only in the densest, most concentrated clumps of the dark matter web. OK, another thing that we understand fairly well is the distribution of galaxies, the large-scale distribution of galaxies in space. 
Um, this is another fly by, fly by movie. This time it is made um, based on the data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which cataloged um, galaxies and distant, about a million galaxies and distances to them. So again, this is data. Um, that includes the shapes and the sizes and the distances to about a million galaxies. So you can see nothing much as you're, we're zooming out of the region near uh, our galaxy, but when we get to large enough scales, you see that the galaxies assemble into these familiar filamentary structures. So you see that the galaxies prefer living in these networks, leaving behind empty voids. This is because they are tracking down the underlying gravity largely created by the dark matter. Um, so this is now observations, this is not theory. Another thing that the basic galaxy formation theory predicts very well, um, and something that's observed in, galaxy, in images like this, um, is that big galaxies like to hang out with big galaxies leaving empty space behind. So this is an, a Hubble Space Telescope image of a galaxy cluster. You can see hundreds of very massive old galaxies assembled in, in very small space, uh, whereas the rest of the space is pretty empty. All right, so now to what we do not know. All right, so I've talked about um, dark matter uh, dominated cosmology and the 800 pound gorilla with a, mil with a million dollar question uh, that I have completely brushed under the rug is, what is this pesky dark matter business made of? All right, so um, it's really, truly remarkable that we can do all of these things without actually understanding the answer to this question. And as a matter of fact, the amazing fact is that the dark matter cosmology is actually much easier than dealing with the normal matter, the hydrogen, helium, and heavier elements. And in the jargon of astrophysicists, um, anything that deals with a normal matter is called dirty baryonic physics. Okay, why is that so? The reason is that as far as we know from all the observations that we have, dark matter interacts only gravitationally with itself and with other matter. So this is one force that we have to include into our calculations. Whereas the normal matter, um, undergoes gravitational interactions with the dark matter and with itself, plus it does all these other complicated things. It cools and it heats and it makes stars and the stars explode and who knows what else. So um, even though we understand the microphysics of the normal matter much better, we have equations of quantum mechanics to tell us all we need to know about this, but actually putting this into the calculation is very, is very difficult because there is so much complexity. Um, so, um, aside from this pesky question of the composition of the dark matter, um, the remaining questions in galaxy formation theory all have to do with our poor understanding of how the normal matter behaves under the influence of galaxies. Um, so one such question uh, is actually the number counts of galaxies. So in particular, the basic galaxy formation theory predicts the wrong number of galaxies, which is a pretty fundamental measurement. And this is illustrated here. Um, on this axis, we have the number of galaxies per decade in mass. And on this axis, we have the mass of the galaxy. So the small, uh, low mass galaxies are on this end, and there are a lot of them. Those are the data points with the error bars. Um, those small galaxies tend to look like this. Those are pretty wimpy um, little disks. Um, our Milky Way galaxy is right about this mass over here at the break of this, um, of this curve. And there are very few galaxies above this mass. So I've shown you this picture of M87, which is extremely massive. There are actually very few um, galaxies like this. Whereas the basic galaxy formation theory predicts more like something like this. So it over predicts the number of galaxies on the low mass end, and it vastly over predicts the number of galaxies on the high mass end. So for example, at this mass over here, the basic galaxy formation theory predicts hundreds of times more galaxies than is observed. All right, so why is this happening in the basic galaxy formation theory? In the basic theory, 
um, way too many stars are being formed. So if you can come up with a mechanism to prevent those new stars from forming, if you can reheat the gas, if you can blow the gas away from the galaxy, then you can probably solve those problems. And things that go boom really help. So this is an example of a thing that is going to go boom. This is a simulation of a first supernova in the universe um, that occurs in a dwarf galaxy. Um, this, is going to sh this is showing you the gas distribution. Again, we see the filamentary structure due to the underlying dark matter. Okay, and the star is going to get formed and it's going to light up and it's a very luminous, very massive star that starts illuminating the matter around it and it starts heating up the gas. This is what you're seeing here. This is what's happening for two or three million years and then something else happens. Woof. So that was a supernova explosion. Um, the star went boom and then if you noticed right after the star went boom, there was a shock wave propagating very fast from the center, um, pushing this shell of expanding gas even further out. So that's it. The entire little galaxy got blown away. And to answer the question um, that I got before the talk, this is possibly the mechanism for creating the very first black holes in the universe. So the gas co collapses and condenses first, forming those first proto-galaxies. And then the explosions of the first massive stars would produce the first black holes in the universe. So um, this is very cool and this is a very powerful process, but it turns out it's not powerful enough. So supernova are not enough um, to solve our problems in galaxy formation. And it turns out that black holes come to the rescue. Okay, so just a very brief introduction to the black holes. If we squeeze Earth into the size of a grape or if we squeeze the Sun into the size of Manhattan, then the gravity on the surface of this object is so strong that nothing can escape, even light. In astronomy, we have two types of black holes. We have um, stellar remnants um, that are produced in explosions like the ones that I showed you on the previous slide. Um, so those are a few Manhattans in size with a lot more mass. Um, and then we also have supermassive black holes. It appears that almost every massive galaxy has a supermassive black hole in its center, which is a really fascinating fact. Um, those things tend to weigh a million to a billion masses of the sun and they, they are stuffed into the size of the solar system. How do we know that they exist? Well, they exert gravity on surrounding stars. And in our own galaxy, we can actually observe the motions of individual stars to track down the gravity of the, of the supermassive black hole. This is an infrared image of the center of our galaxy. And what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in all the way into this white square and track the motions of the star, those, those faint little things, inside that square. And this is what was done by a couple of groups, um, in, one in Germany and one at UCLA over a period of um, close to 20 years by now. And they have seen that those um, stars move around an unseen, very massive object whose location is marked with this white star over here. And in particular, there's this remarkable star S2, which over a period of a dozen years or so made a full revolution on its orbit around the supermassive black hole. These observations actually allow us to measure the mass of the object that needs to produce these orbital motions. It turns out to be about four million um, masses of the sun. In external galaxies, we cannot see individual stars. The entire galaxy is a blur. It's way too far away for us to do observations of the kind that I showed before. Um, so instead, we rely on observations of the sum of all st stellar motions. So this is the uh, sum of all velocities of the stars um, as a function of the distance from the center of this galaxy, NGC 1277. And there's this characteristic rise of the velocity dispersion toward the center, uh, of the velocity toward the center of the galaxy. So if there was no black hole producing this extra gravity, there would be a much smoother curve um, over here. Um, this is remarkable achievement that was um, uh, possible mostly because of the observations with the Hubble Space Telescope over the last 20 years or so. 
Um, there were a couple of groups that have been um, doing this, including a Nuker team, um, and Scott Germain, who's a professor here, is one of the founding members of the Nuker team, and among other things, they have demonstrated that more um, bigger black holes tend to live in bigger galaxies. Um, and the ratio of the mass is about one to a thousand. So the black hole is about one thousandth of the mass of the entire host galaxy. So by comparison to the galaxy is this tiny little thing <laughs> in our everyday terms is this enormous um, um, supermassive thing. The amazing thing is that with these observations, supermassive black holes have become really mundane astronomical objects. We see them every day, and if you are a supermassive black hole, you're not even going to make it to the pages of Science or Nature magazine unless you're a very special supermassive black hole. So um, this one was actually in the Nature uh, because it's not just supermassive, it's super hyper duper massive. So they published <laughs> that one. But um, otherwise, you know, they're like, an, yeah, another black hole, whatever, everyday thing. Um, okay. So what can they do? Most of the time, most of the lifetime of the galaxy, they passively sit in the center of the galaxy, exerting gravity on surrounding stars. It is true, that, though, that once something falls in, it cannot get out, including light. This is a very neat calculation by Shapiro and Tukolsky um, that starts off with a small black hole in the center of a um, stellar cluster, and the black hole swallows stars one by one, and it increases in mass and it increases in size until it swallowed all the stars, and that's it. They're gone. That's the end product, and you have this dark mass sitting there. But that's basically it. However, the matter just outside the black hole can be very vocal. Um, so if there is gas present in the galaxy and it makes it all the way to the center of this galaxy, then the gravity of the black hole will attract this gas and the gas will start falling in, so the black hole will start eating it. Um, but on the way in, the gas produces a lot of radiation. And this is an artist's um, illustration of what this process might look like. The black hole here is in the center. The gas settles into this disk. Um, which is mostly orbiting around the black hole like the planets orbit the sun, um, but it's also slowly settling into the black hole, gradually increasing its size and its mass. As it's settling into the black hole, it produces radiation, a lot of it, and this is shown schematically with those blue plumes um, coming out. In fact, this radiation is so powerful that it can blast through the gas of the entire galaxy. If you have an object like this in the center of the galaxy, that, that ra this radiation can uh, push on all the gas, on the surrounding gas in the galaxy. Um, the amazing fact is that um, there is enough energy released as one gram of matter falls into the black hole to throw out five kilograms of matter out of the galaxy. So in other words, there's plenty of energy available in this infalling material to reheat or clear up the entire galaxy worth of mass. Um, and so black hole winds, which is what happens when you start throwing uh, matter out of the galaxy, can in fact throw out all the gas and suppress the formation of overly massive galaxies by preventing this gas from forming new stars. So we had this old theory we now suppress all the star formation in those massive galaxies, and we can bring the theory in much better agreement with observations. All right, so how might this happen in practice? Um, this simulation will show you a merger of two very gas-rich galaxies. Um, so let's get that started. So there are two disks. Um, those are two galaxy disks that are coming together. They're going to do this complicated song and dance. But now the black hole winds have been included in this calculation. Um, so as they interact, some of the gas makes it all the way to the center of the galaxies, 
and you can start seeing a little bit of black hole driven wind in this picture. So this fuzzy stuff that is coming out of the galaxy is the black hole wind produced at this point by the small black holes in the centers of each, um, of each galaxy. But once these galaxies make their way all the way to the final coalescence, all the way to the final merger, the black hole grows and becomes very massive and produces a lot of emission and produces a very powerful wind. So now we are seeing um, something much more energetic. So all of the gas that was present in those two galaxies is being thrown out. Um, most of it is in this diffuse form, uh, but there are also some clumps that are coming out at large velocities, never to return. So all of this gas can no longer be used to make new stars. And if you look at the stars in this galaxy, um, the stars, um, this is color-coded uh, with red being the old stars and blue being the young stars. So the blue stars are the ones that formed during this merger process, but most of the stars are red, and this galaxy is on the way to becoming a red elliptical. And it will no longer be able to form any new stars, and it will just sit there. So again, to answer the question that I received, um, before the talk, this is a self-regulation process. This is why we establish this correlation between the masses of the black holes and the masses of the galaxy. Because if the, ga if the galaxy tries to feed too much mass into the black hole, the black hole produces a more powerful wind and shuts off the star formation and stops its own feeding. And so um, they land on this correlation between the mass of the galaxy and the black hole mass. All right, so this was all theory and numerical simulations. So what about observations? Um, this has been a very active area of research. There are several groups looking for black hole driven winds. Um, this is a complicated phenomenon. There are many different wavelengths um, in astronomy uh, that can probe different aspects and different physical conditions in this complicated problem. Most of the modern astronomy is done in the so-called Q automated mode. So you write a script um, that you upload to your telescope, and then the telescope executes all the commands, you know, point over here, take this exposure with this instrument. Um, and the great advantage, of course, is that you can go about your normal life and go to bed on time and sleep while the telescope is doing all the work. Um, however, for a variety of reasons, for this particular project, we actually did a classical observing run on the Gemini North Telescope, which is located on Mauna Kea. Um, so Mauna Kea is a very busy summit with some nature-made uh, volcanic cones and some human-made telescope domes. And um, it was a couple of years ago in December, and a lot of things happened on this pretty short run. Um, and with classical observing, you do have to go all the way to the summit, and you do have to stay up all night and drink lots of coffee and whatnot. And so one of the things that happened during this run was that there was a blizzard that came very abruptly. And so we had to uh, conduct an emergency closing of the telescope, and then the 15 minutes that it took the observing specialist to close up the telescope, our car completely froze over, um, iced over. And um, the dorms where astronomers stay when they're not observing are located a few thousand feet below the summit. And so we had to drive down, and so I have this very painful memory of standing in this blistering cold with my hands shaking, holding a flashlight, and scraping off an inch of ice off of the car. But anyway, it was all worth it. So we got the data. Um, we got the data, it was very interesting. And this is what the data actually look like. So what do we actually observe? If you recall, once the black hole starts driving this wind, it throws the gas out and it heats the gas. So our observations turn out to be sensitive to gas at about 10 to 20,000 degrees which in layman's terms is uh, pretty hot, but by astronomical standards, it's like lukewarm. Um, and unlike stars, this type of gas does not produce a lot of emissions, so we have to use um, special techniques in order to actually detect it, which is why this is a um, difficult observation to do. So the first thing uh, we can do is to measure the extent of those winds compared to the extent of the galaxy. So this is nine different objects, um, nine different black hole winds um, as they appear on the sky. And by comparison, here is the typical size of the galaxy here. So I'm going to flip 
um, between them. So you can see that the black hole wind engulfs the entire galaxy and goes well beyond into the intergalactic space. We can also use these observations to measure the amount of gas that is being thrown out of the galaxy. That turns out to be a very large amount. Um, and um, what is actually plotted here is the velocities of the gas. So we cannot measure the velocities um, in the plane of the sky, but we can measure the velocity along the line of sight. And the blue stuff is moving towards you, and the red stuff is moving away from you. And so, um, what are all these red and blue patterns that we see in these objects? So let me show you very schematically what we think is happening. So suppose the black hole is in the center, and it's producing this outflow, and it's roughly biconical. So this stuff is moving away from the black hole in this direction. This stuff is moving away from the black hole in this direction. So now, let's start tilting this outflow. So I'm going to tilt the line of sight so that the right-hand side, I guess your left-hand side, uh, is, is slightly going towards you, um, and the red stuff is going slightly away from you. And I'm going to keep tilting the line of sight until you basically get one blob that's moving forward and one blob that's moving away from you. And that's pretty similar to the structures that we observe um, in these objects. So we, we do um, more careful modeling of this process, but that's the basic idea. Um, another thing that we think is that this gas, these blobs look very smooth, but we don't think that they're actually smooth. We think that the picture is more like this artist's representation. So you can see that as the wind blows through the gas in the galaxy, it takes with it those clumps of gas and dust. And so we think that we see this combined emission um, of the much smaller clumps that we cannot see individually um, in this very distant galaxy. Um, these observations provide actual measurements that we can compare with a theory. Um, so this is what's seen in external galaxies. Uh, one of the very exciting developments of the last two or three years is the work done by Doug Finkbeiner at Harvard and collaborators, um, in which they think they have actually detected um, a relic of a past explosion associated with a supermassive black hole in our own galaxy. Um, so this is the actual data. This is the data from the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope, and you can see this um, bright emission um, above and below the plane of the galaxy. So um, this is our galaxy, and we are at the edge of the galaxy. So we are actually seeing our own galaxy very closely edge on. Um, and so this is the plane of the galaxy that's been masked in those data, and we see stuff that's above and below the galaxy plane. So there was some explosion some time ago. Nowadays, the black hole is quiescent, but some time ago, there was a powerful explosion that threw out material above the plane and below the plane, and this is what we think we're seeing in those data. Um, and this is an artist representation superposed on the actual um, optical image of our own galaxy of what this uh, relic of the explosion um, might look like. All right, to summarize, um, galaxies are luminous knots in the cosmic web, which is largely dominated by the dark matter. Um, it's pretty fascinating that most massive galaxies contain supermassive black holes in their centers. Both galaxies and their black holes from, formed from gas that cooled and condensed. In one case, um, in the case of galaxies, it condensed into stars, and then in the case of black hole, the black hole ate it up to increase in size. As matter falls into black hole, it, the matter releases a lot of energy before it gets into the black hole, and there's a sufficient amount of energy to clear off um, the gas from the entire galaxy. So aside from a few artist's representations that were uh, thus noted, uh, most of the pictures and movies that I showed you aren't just pictures and movies. They're actual solutions to equations some of the nasty ones that look like this, um, um, that we can now do with these powerful computer simulations. So we have put together a picture using theory and observations and some imagination. We have put together a roughly self-consistent picture um, of galaxy formation. Um, 
and I will stop here and I'll take questions. <laughs>